my name is Salome Cook. I'm a PhD student at the University of New Hampshire and a 2017 uh, Blue Waters Fellow. I'm in the Oceanography Department at the University of New Hampshire. Today I'll be talking about some re research I've been working on using the Blue Water System over the past two years, um, specifically looking at nutrient loads from estuaries to the coastal ocean and the role of model resolution and vegetation on numerical estimates of nutrient loads. So why does this matter? Well, everyone in this room is part of a watershed, and you all live downstream of someone. You probably live upstream of someone, too, but you definitely live downstream. So the activities that happen in the watershed affect you, um, particularly um, any land management practices. What happens is precipitation will fall on a watershed. Then it will, um, surface runoff will take anything like pollutants, contaminants, sediment into your local tributaries or streams, go to the river, and then eventually that will end up downstream um, into the coastal ocean. And the area that I focus on is what's called an estuary, essentially where um, the river meets the ocean. There's a lot of really interesting dynamics that happen when salt water and fresh water mix. And a lot of these dynamics and properties are really important um, for ecosystem health. And um, there's a, a really good reason why 50% of the world's population live within 50 miles of the coast. It's because it's a really important area and a really biologically active area. Um, and of the 32 largest cities in the world, 22 of them actually exist on estuaries. So um, what is the biggest threat to these systems? Nutrient pollution. And um, in a 2015 EPA study on the cost of nutrient pollution um, in our sort of in our economy, really nutrient pollution, which is also called eutrophication, is defined as the excess amount of nitrogen and phosphorus in aquatic systems. It's one of the leading causes of water quality impairment in the United States. And actually, watershed degradation costs global cities about five and a half billion, billion dollars in water treatment costs annually. So um, if we're just looking at agricultural production and we're just looking at nitrogen in terms of fertilizer, Really, since World War II, the production of nitrogen has gone up steadily. There's a dip in the late 80s and early 90s. That's due to the Soviet Union collapse. But pretty much, we've been pumping in synthetic fertilizer into our system for decades. And it's causing some really big problems. So if I zoom into where the river meets the ocean, this coastal area, um, the, yellow, the yellow arrows sort of show nutrient fluxes. And there's a lot that we know about in terms of um, atmospheric deposition from industry, urban runoff, agricultural runoff, residential runoff, wastewater treatment plants, which is known as a point source of nitrogen and phosphorus to a system, um, and precipitation, leaky septic systems. We have a pretty good idea of a lot of these fluxes. Um, where my research fits in is this part of the estuary. Essentially, the nutrient flux is associated from sediment resuspension. So essentially anything that disturbs a sediment bed will then resuspend sediment and any of the water associated with that is trapped in that sediment or attached to the sediment itself will be released into the overlying water column and then you have a nutrient flux from sediments. Um, we can use maps to estimate nutrient loads on land, but it's actually really difficult to estimate it from sediments. Right? So um, I sort of am focusing on these fluxes right here. Um, this one always takes a second, right? So my specific research questions are, does sediment resuspension from mud flats significantly contribute to nutrient loading in estuaries? And I have a particular estuary I'm looking at for that. And for this talk, what is the relative importance of model resolution, which is where Blue Waters comes in, and the presence of subaquatic vegetation on the distribution of shear stress? So the parameter I'm looking at is shear stress, because shear stress drives sediment resuspension, which then drives nutrient loading um, in these environments. What's unique about this research is that I use, I'm, I'm using numerical models, but I'm also, I also go collect observations myself. So we use um, acoustic instruments to sort of validate our models. And in terms of nutrient loading, we actually collect our own sediment cores and apply a shear stress and collect nutrient loading data from that. So um, it's a pretty interesting project that sort of combines all these areas. Um, the specific region I'm looking at is um, a small estuary called the um, Great Bay Estuary. It's located in the southeastern portion of New Hampshire within the Gulf of Maine. Um, it's one of 28 estuaries of national significance. The EPA has sort of listed a bunch of estuaries and this falls in, in there. It's tidally dominant as are most of the estuaries in the Gulf of Maine, so the primary forcing is tides. The currents are on the order of one to two meters per second. 
and it has relatively low river input, which is important. A lot of estuaries have really large river input. This particular one only has about 2% of the tidal prism are due to rivers. Um, I know this picture is pretty, pretty hard to see, but there are major tidal channels that sort of um, branch out, and then these are all mud flats. So that's sort of why my question is pertaining to mud flats in particular in terms of this, uh, this estuary. So if I'm looking at the New Hampshire watershed, um, in this area of New Hampshire, our population has grown by 20% in 20 years. And also we've um, sort of increased our impervious surface, co surface cover by about 5 to 6%, which has led to some serious um, water quality degradation. Of all the estuaries in the US, this is usually a pretty pristine one, but it's showing signs of eutrophication. So if I take a look at total nitrogen loads to the estuary over a period of time from 2012 to 2016, as I showed before, wastewater treatment plants is what's known as a point source of nutrient loading into an estuary. And these are other watershed sources, i.e. fertilizer, septic systems, animal waste, atmospheric deposition. And those are the ones we can quantify, and that's about 67% of the whole load. So um, nowhere in there does it list sediments. So essentially, it could change this pie chart if we start adding um, understanding what internal cycling from sediments into um, the water column, what that nutrient load is, will change this pie chart. Um, so in very basic terms, you apply a shear stress to a bed, essentially a tidal forcing water movement across a sediment bed. If you, um, and that's what this tau B is, it's sort of related to the um, vertical gradient and the horizontal velocity field. So tides moving over a bed look kind of like this, whereas waves sort of do this little wiggle. Um, if you exceed some critical threshold, essentially um, you disturb sediment enough, it'll resuspend. And that's based on the characteristics of the sediment itself. And so then when you exceed that threshold, you then release sediment and um, pour water that are sort of stuck between these sediment grains into the overlying water column. So um, a big question here is, where's the mud? So in Great Bay, we used some, some results from a previous study showing that you know, these mud flats are in the green and orange areas. Essentially, those are the areas where we have nutrients. So you have to have greater than 50% mud fraction to then actually have nutrients stuck in your interstitial water areas. Um, and so we want to look for areas that have greater than 50% mud fraction. And then based on that sediment chamber experiment, greater than 0.35 newtons per meter squared for nutrient release. So. Um, we really, we can, we can calculate um, shear stress estimates in a couple areas in the bay based on acoustic velocity measurements, but we really can't say anything about the shear stress across the entire estuary. So we really need a numerical model. So all of the science had sort of hit this point and then they couldn't make an estimate of nutrient loading from sediments because we couldn't say anything about the shear stress across the entire system. So this is the model setup. This was our next step. So we took a bunch of maps and created a bathymetric grid, which you see here. It's about 22 kilometers by 25 kilometers, and it's about 35 meters in the, uh, the coastal ocean. And then you have sort of a deep channel here, and then these are all fringing mud flats. Um, the modeling system we use is called COAST. It's a coupled ocean atmospheric wave and sediment transport modeling system. It uses ROMS, which is an um, ocean model based out of Rutgers which is the regional ocean modeling system. It solves the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations using finite differencing. Um, it's written in Fortran, uses C preprocessing, and the output is written into NetCDF files. Um, the horizontal resolution of this model is 30 meters, um, but in order to go higher, we really needed blue waters, and this is what I propose to do, is run a 10 meter grid. That's a 10 meter horizontal by horizontal grid cell. Um, uh, we really needed the blue water system for this. And then the whole, um, the whole uh, domain is split into eight vertical sigma layers. So if I'm taking a look at sort of one vertical column, you have your grid set, split up into water cells, then you have this bottom water cell, then you have sediment here. So essentially, we really care about the velocities in this bottom cell. And what that looks like is you have a U and a V velocity, and then you have some bottom roughness element and this is uh, your boundary layer. So it, in, you essentially in this model pick your boundary layer. And so we picked a logarithmic law of the wall. It works pretty well. And you really, you need to input this value of Z naught. And then from, from this sort of velocity gradient, you get a shear stress. 
And so the first paper that came out of our work with Blue Waters was just looking for this one little number. Um, and this just shows how that cell will change, the size of this cell will change based on sort of tidal forcing. All right, some more model setup. So we use another ocean model to drive this model. We use an o Oregon State tidal prediction model. Um, sort of this is what the forcing looks like. You essentially send the tide through this boundary and it propagates throughout the system. It takes about two days to ramp up. Um, we've closed the boundaries on these three edges. It's only open here and that's where the tide's coming in. Um, like I said, this logarithmic drag law uh, is what we prescribe in the model. And this one value was a, a paper that came out using blue waters. It incorporates wetting and drying, which, a, which is a relatively recent incorporation into ocean models in general. It's actually really difficult to make a cell dry and then have no flux going in and out of that cell. So the data output um, for this run was 30-day run, 30-minute average files, um, and that essentially informs our shear stress over an entire month, every 30 minutes. And then five-minute station data, essentially we picked a bunch of stations where we had observational output, and we compared it at a more high temporal resolution. Otherwise, um, it would sort of be a little too big to deal with, a little too big of big data. Um, so this is sort of what we get in, in a time uh, snapshot of what shear stress is across the bay. So this is at low tide, and this is sort of what our tidal forcing looks like. Essentially, it's what our surface level is. So um, you can see it's a little bit stronger here than it is here. Um, in this area, over a month, you have what's known as spring and neap tides. So spring tides are the higher high tides of the month, and neap tides are sort of a, a lower range. And so we really wanted to incorporate that because it really actually makes a difference, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. So you can see across the bay, um, if you think about 0.35, so red, anything red is sort of greater than 0.35, and that's our magical number for nutrient fluxes. So across the mud flats, there really aren't a lot of areas that have greater than 0.35, right? So we care about where the mud is, just putting that there for a reference. Now on flooding tide, which are the stronger flooding, which is sort of fills up the entire estuary, ebbing is what drains it. Our flood currents are a bit stronger than our ebb currents. So you can see that actually there are lots of, lots of areas on the mud flats that exceed 0.35 newtons per meter squared. So that means that this is essentially an, um, a time period where you might be fluxing nutrients into the water column. And this is just a normal tide, not an extreme event. So high tide, you've filled the entire basin. Water isn't moving that much, so you don't have a lot of shear stress. So you aren't really fluxing nutrients over um, in this particular stage of the tide. And you put it together, and it should look something. So this is what we get from blue waters. This is the output over you know, every half hour, over a couple tidal cycles. We can sort of estimate nutrient, well, we estimate shear stress. Shear stress then estimates nutrient loading, right? This little green dot is the one data point we have for shear stress to compare. We have another estimate up here, but that's not really in the bay and that's not really over mud, so we don't really incorporate that into this work. Um, so this is direct results from, from blue waters. So, um, all right, so again, step one, where is the mud? Um, step two, areas that are greater than 0.35 newtons per meter squared. So this really incorporated a bunch of lab studies um, that were done in 2000, in, uh, based on a paper in 2015. And then if you take the area that are greater than 0.35 newtons per meter squared and greater than 50% mud fraction, you, um, you know, find a, a loading of nitrogen and phosphorus um, based on these sort of estimates. So um, this study you found 1.3 millimoles of nitrogen per meter squared could be fluxed out of the Great Bay, uh, the sediments in the Great Bay, and then 0.21 millimoles of phosphorus. So this is how we get our nutrient loads. Um, so Wengrove made the first estimate during an extreme event. She, she um, had shear stress estimates during a storm and so then made an estimate there. We're sort of looking at ambient conditions, right? What about a typical tidal cycle? So I'll have you focus on the top part of this, um, this chart. If you're looking at dissolved inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus, the two nutrients we care about, over an entire month, you see the, the top four lines are rivers. So fall, winter, summer are relatively low. Spring, you have high freshets. So you have a lot of 
Um, in the northeast, we have a lot of snow melt. You have a lot of precipitation, a lot of runoff. So you have a really high load of um, nitrogen and phosphorus during those months. And then sediments, based on um, our results from blue waters, of about 750. So that's on the same order as rivers, right? Um, there's an asterisk for phosphorus because there might be some chemical dynamics that aren't necessarily included here. Essentially, if you have iron in the water, it sort of preferentially takes phosphorus out. So there, there's some chemical dynamics not included here, right? So this is over an entire month. We compare sediments to rivers over a month. Now, what about an event? So hurricane or superstorm Irene, because it was a superstorm by the time it hit New Hampshire. Um, she found, what Megan Wingrove found that 220 kilograms of nitrogen and about 80 of phosphorus were fluxed during that event over the entire Great Bay. Um, what we found is over a tidal cycle, average tidal cycle of about 25 kilograms, a neap tide, 13, but a spring tide is 91. So, um, you know, once a month, a couple tidal cycles, you have something that's on the order, about a half of an event, right? So this is technically an event, right? So we have these, these sort of loads are pretty important on a, on a um, monthly and weekly time scale. So what about resolution and vegetation? Up to this point, we've only talked about our 30 meter model grid and not included vegetation. So how do we include vegetation? Well, we take maps. There's a long-term data set from the 1980s till present, which is a very unique thing to have in an estuary. It's very difficult and costly to have aerial maps of eelgrass. So it's really lucky that we have uh, this, this data set. Um, so we take, we take an eelgrass map and we essentially mask it into the model. And this is the schematic. It, you can include waves in this situation, but we only are looking at tides. Right? So essentially, this is what an eelgrass bed kind of looks like. What it does is it damps the currents. It essentially lowers the, um, the drag, or it increases the drag in, in the bottom, and uh, preferentially sort of settles out sediment. So it increases sedimentation. It masks areas that you would normally have nutrient fluxes. Um, you wouldn't because you have eelgrass. Um, it's really important. It's a, it creates habitat. It's essentially a nursery for a lot of fish. Um, like I said, dampens currents, promotes sedimentation, and it actually uptakes nutrients. So, so vegetation is really important. Um, so if we take a look at that same chart, um, if you look at just the 30 meter and the 10 meter um, estimates, you can see that they're actually pretty close. So what this means is that you can run a 30 meter grid and kind of get close. So you don't have to have this high computational expense if you're just looking at um, uh, sediment uh, nutrient loads from sediments. Eelgrass, you can see, actually lowers your nutrient loading, which is what you would expect, right? It's in areas that are muddy. It's, it's sort of masking these areas, and it's um, preventing sediment from being, oh, sorry, OK. Um, and so an event, you can see that it's, all, it, um, but essentially those, um, that eelgrass also lowers it, right? So that's really important. Um, so research outcomes. We validated a high-res ocean model, published paper. Vegetation is important for trapping sediment, and this is a paper that's in prep, and it's based on a talk I gave at Woods Hole in February. Um, no real gain in this particular research question for using the 10-meter grid, which is great for computational savings. Um, and fellowship outcomes, I was able to go to a couple conferences, which actually opened up funding for some younger students in my lab group. Um, we're planning on having two more publications, and I've been able to uh, mentor some undergraduates in HPC. Um, ongoing is just sharing what I've learned through the Blue Waters group and sharing data with local scientists. Um, and sort of future work, incorporate waves, um, looking to help some oyster restoration efforts. Actually, I've been heavily involved in using Blue Waters data to help pick oyster, oyster restoration areas and model coupling, including uh, sort of incorporating these models into an overall watershed model and then connecting estuaries to to ocean models. So we don't really, we can't really span that. We don't, ha we don't have the capability of connecting watersheds to the ocean. So estuaries are in the middle. So it'd be really great to be able to couple that whole system together. And uh, if you remember anything, remember that you all live downstream. So <laughs> thank you for your attention.